Welcome to episode 396 of the Selling Your Screenplay podcast. I'm Ashley Scott Myers, screenwriter and blogger over at SellingYourScreenplay.com. Today I am interviewing screenwriter Eric Pearson, who just wrote the new Scarlett Johansson film, Black Widow. We obviously talk a great deal about that film and his writing on it, but he's a writer who really rose up through the ranks of the Marvel writing system. So we talk about how he got into that and worked on various Marvel projects before Black Widow. So stay tuned for that interview. If you find this episode valuable, please help me out by giving me a review in iTunes or leaving a comment on YouTube or retweeting the podcast on Twitter or liking or sharing it on Facebook. These social media shares really do help spread word about the podcast, so they're very much appreciated. Any websites or links that I mention the podcast can be found in my blog or on the show notes. I also publish a transcript with every episode in case you'd rather read the show or look at something later on. You can find all the podcast show notes at www.sellingyourscreenplay.com slash podcast. And then just look for episode number 396. If you want my free guide, How to Sell a Screenplay in Five Weeks, you can pick that up by going to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash guide. It's completely free. You just put in your email address and I'll send you a new lesson once per week for five weeks along with a bunch of bonus lessons. I teach the whole process of how to sell a screenplay in that guide. I'll teach you how to write a professional logline and query letter and how to find agents, managers, and producers who are looking for material. Really is everything you need to know to sell your screenplay. Just go to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash guide. So now let's get into the main segment. Today I am interviewing screenwriter Eric Pearson. Here is the interview. Welcome, Eric, to the Selling Your Screenplay podcast. I really appreciate you coming on the show with me today. Oh, thanks for having me. So to start out, maybe you can tell us a little bit about your background. Where did you grow up and how did you get interested in the entertainment business? Uh, well, I grew up uh, in a town about 30 minutes outside of Boston, Massachusetts, and uh yeah, I, I don't know, started doing theater in high school. Thought I thought I could maybe be an actor. I'm really bad at it, <laughs> as it turns out. Uh, so fortunately, I mean, we had a pretty uh, comprehensive theater department there, which is really great. So we were able to learn a few other things, wrote some short plays, and uh, I don't know. Figured I knew that that was a world that I wanted to be in, telling stories and. Uh, I figured that that was just uh, the better move for me. Yeah, yeah. So what were some of those steps once you're out of high school? Um, did you go to film school? Did you get a screenwriting major? Maybe talk us through some of those steps. What was after high school um, to actually turn this into a career? Yeah, I well, I, I held on to the uh, being an actor dream for too long. I, uh-huh. I auditioned for a few conservatories uh, for, for college. I got rejected from all of them. Uh, but in kind of a stroke of dumb luck, I noticed that NYU had, uh, in the Tisch School of the Arts, had a specific writing department in their art school. Hmm. So I randomly just decided, well, instead of just to kind of hedge my bets, I'm going to submit some of my short stories and short plays. And while I got rejected from all the acting schools, uh, I actually got scholarships to go to NYU. I was like, well, that's, that's an encouraging sign. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I was at, I was at uh, Tisch for undergrad and really kind of was able to get an understanding of, of how this actually could be a job, you know, writing movies, writing TV. Mm-hmm. Uh, and as soon as I, as soon as I graduated, I just drove right out to Los Angeles. And actually one of my professors got me a great job to start. It only lasted about a year and a half after when I first got out, but I was a reader for DreamWorks hmm. when I first arrived back when, you know, there were more reader jobs for, for those who don't know, a reader basically is just as, as scripts get submitted, someone uh, reads them and basically does a book report and you get paid Mm -hmm. per script. Uh, So that was a great way to kind of, you know, get a a good sense of what's out there for material and and what other people are reading and what's going on as well as make some money. So that, that got me started. And uh, yeah, then I was just, then I was just in, in the pack amongst all your other uh, struggling writers out there. Mm-hmm. So let's talk about that. Then you're in LA, you're starting to um, read a lot of scripts, build a network. Um, some of your early credits as a screenwriter um, were Marvel one shot shorts. Maybe you can talk about those. How did you go from reading scripts to getting some of those early gigs with Marvel? Um, did you get an agent first? Were you able to break in without an agent? Maybe talk us through that a little bit. In, you're suggesting a great passage of time too, because it was it was a long time. Uh, I did I got an agent almost within the first year of, of moving out to Los Angeles. Kind of made the decision like I'm going to work random jobs, kind of cobble together rent, and try and be a writer as opposed to get like, you know, mm-hmm. a job that require all my time and not let me write that that much. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I decided to go for it, but it was right around that time I feel like there was a, a pretty marked 
transition in the industry from a spec market for scripts to uh, more IP or adapting things or, or pitching as opposed to, you know, I feel like it, uh, what the, the stories I heard, I was never truly a part of this, but uh, in the 80s and 90s, you know, someone would write an original spec, a lethal weapon or something like that. And mm-hmm. then on Tuesdays, uh, that their agent would say to all of the studios and all the production companies, here it comes. You, you, everyone's getting it at nine, mm-hmm. which would then, of course, create a competitive market. I think that uh, when I first got out here, I was still, I, I, I thought that that was going to be the path when it really wasn't. It's hard to arrive in a town where that was, that was changing, especially in, in, in my field. Mm-hmm. So uh, my agent, my first agent didn't work out so much. I was, you know, working a bunch of random jobs. I was a pizza delivery guy. I was a temp. I was a, a, a driver, like a, a delivery driver. What's that called? A messenger. Yeah, I was a messenger. I worked at a movie theater. All just to keep my time free to, to write more. And eventually, I don't know how my uh, some of my work got to my my next agent, who is my agent now. I think his assistant, actually, who I owe a great debt to, had read stuff and put it on his boss's desk. And I switched agencies and then threw uh, his help, my, my agent to this day, Doug. Shout out, Doug. Uh and also a previous relationship I'd had with just some people from Hangout who was working at Marvel. I, I auditioned essentially to become part of the Marvel Writers Program, which, mm-hmm. you know, uh, it was very early days, the nascent days at, at Marvel Studios. Mm-hmm. They had, uh, beyond just the people working on the titles in production or in pre-production, they had a few of us there trying to stockpile material for later. Uh, uh, and I ended. That's how I ended up getting that job. And I, I was that was eight years coming, uh, eight years of kind of struggling mm-hmm. before I actually got truly paid to be a writer. Uh, so once I was in there, I was I was working very very hard. I thought I'll do anything. I'm, I wasn't I didn't have any sort of ego about it. Mm-hmm. I wasn't trying to only do features. I wasn't trying to use it as a springboard to be somewhere else in the industry. Uh, and one of the things that they brought up was the idea of. Marvel one shots, which I believe the the original pitch for it was like Pixar, like let's do short films that can air ahead of our features in the theater the way that Pixar does. Uh, and as a as a trial for it, we we did a couple of one shots that ended up we we pitched it was our goal I think was to do before the features in the theater, but we the way we got it done was as extra content on DVDs and Blu-rays. I gotcha. Um, I think it might have ultimately it been too expensive to get the shorts done, especially because 3D was big then too. So if you were in a 3D audience, and then anyway, mm-hmm. that's all that uh, that's all details that don't matter. That's how I ended up writing the the shorts for Marvel. I was in the, the program working with uh, Brad Winterbaum, uh, who was one of our producers on Black Widow and on and my producer on Thor Ragnarok as well. And we were just yeah, we we're just making cool stuff. Mm-hmm. Gotcha, gotcha. So let's dig into your latest film, Black Widow, starring Scarlett Johansson. Maybe to start out, you can just give us a quick pitch or logline. What is sort of the logline for this film? Oh my God, I've never had to do that. <laughs> no one, no one has asked me that. That's so crazy. No one has asked me to, to pitch it. I think that everyone's just assumed that everyone knows. This. Uh, yeah, it's the, it's. It's a middle of her life origin story for Natasha Romanoff, the the Black Widow, a famed Russian spy defector turned Shield agent, turned Avenger. Who, uh, you know, we're we're meeting people from her past uh, that that allows and confronts kind of demons from her past, allowing her to move on towards the future. Mm-hmm. Gotcha, Boy, gotcha. that's not very good. I just thought it's so funny. I haven't had to pitch it ever. Huh. So, well, that's, and that sort of leads me to my next question is, I'm curious, you know, when you got involved in this project, what exactly did they have story-wise? Um, I noticed on IMDb, there's two other story by credits, Ned Benson and Jake Schaffer. Um, did they already have a draft done? Did they come to a treatment? Maybe just walk us through that process. What does this look like when a writer like you lands on a project like this? At what state is that project already in? I mean, obviously there's already a back story with this character. She's already appeared in other movies, but what do you have starting going in with this writing project? Sure. I also I should say Jack. It's Jack Schaefer. She was the one who ran uh, uh, Wandavision, uh, and she's a she's a terrific writer. I don't know. I, it's someone uh, a mispronunciation. I would always want to be corrected. So I'm sorry if that was rude. No, no. Problem. Uh, no. So what they had is uh, what they had is when I arrived, they they had a lot of kind of broad building blocks. You know, they had we obviously knew who Natasha Romanoff was through I believe at that point seven or eight movies. We established a certain kind of version of her character. Uh, and because 
you know, spoiler alert, in Avengers Endgame, uh, we see her sacrifice herself. We know that she's going to die. And so it couldn't, it wasn't, we knew that the movie wasn't happening after she's dead because then there's no movie. So I arrived and they had kind of decided that it would take place in this period between Captain America Civil War and Avengers Infinity War. And they also had uh, not so much mandates, but strong suggestions. They had, they had this idea of, uh, and a, a family similar to the Americans, the FX show, like a Russian sleeper uh, unit, family unit in, in the United States that she was a part of. We thought that would be a fun, unexpected thing from her past. And and we were talking about right from the beginning, this kind of getting the gang back together uh, structure for the story. Mm-hmm. And there was also, uh, they really wanted to introduce Taskmaster, the, the villain into this, into this, into this movie. So, but that that was kind of that was really that those were the big things, and also they I, I they really wanted a there's a there's a few things from the comic there's a there's a cool panel in the comic of her shooting her way out of a window and diving out of this base that's in the sky and going into a free fall, hmm. uh, and and that was something they were like this would be great if we could get there so it was it was a few puzzle pieces that they had. But the funny thing is that they didn't know what the whole puzzle looked like put together, and that's what I had to figure out. I was, uh, we, and, and uh, there were some things that were just known, just that were all, all, like even I kind of knew it before I talked to them. I was like, if it's the Black Widow movie, having read comics before, I was pretty sure that Yelena Belova was going to be involved. Mm-hmm. Like she is a very uh, important kind of uh, counterpart to Natasha Romanoff in the comics, so. I, I was pretty certain that, that she was going to be involved. This version of her, I thought, was much kind of cooler than just, <clears throat> you know, uh, oh, I'm the blonde version of you who's a little bit more evil. Like, I felt like this had had much more of a uh, a story resonance, a bit more, she had a bit more individuality. I thought the relationship really kind of helped uh, make the whole movie. Um, so, yeah, those were, those were some of the things that they had worked out. But it was it was still... I mean, it was pretty wide open as, as far as everything else. Mm-hmm. Gotcha, gotcha. So let's just talk about sort of the logistics of this. I'm just sort of curious how all this works. So once you got hired on this project, um, do you start out doing a bunch of treatments um, and then you start to do drafts? And I'm just curious, again, how many treatments did you do? How many drafts did you do? And and who is is involved with these different um, the different development steps? Well, there's a lot of people involved because when I was brought in, there were, there were people in place already. Kate Shortland, our director, had been brought on. Uh, obviously, Scarlett Johansson had it was not only you know cast, but was a, a producer on this movie as well. So she and, and this is a character that she had been embodying for the better part of you know ten years now. So she you know had a lot of opinions and thoughts on where it was going to go. Plus, Kevin Feige's involved. My producer Brian Chapek was involved. Uh, so when I arrived, uh, it, we all just, it was kind of like a big, you know, sit down meeting. I believe Scarlett was finishing up Endgame or finishing up press or she would call in, but you know, she was present, but couldn't be as present as, as everybody else. But it was me, Kate, Kevin, Brian, they first of all, they right away, they would fill me in on like, okay, here's what we've done. Here's what's not working. Here's what we like. Here's where, you know, kind of where we want to go. And I would talk about, you know, so we would, we would talk we did like there was a lot of long days of just talking at first Mm -hmm. and then for me for these big movies uh it's very important to have a treatment like i don't i don't think treatments are necessary for all kinds of screenplays but for for big studio movies like this i just feel like there's so many moving parts they're so complicated there's so much that can get out of control you'd be stupid to not have a blueprint Mm -hmm. um so i once we kind of talked about the themes and the characters and stories and what we wanted the relationships to be like and who we wanted to be playing these characters. Then I started working more with uh, Brian and Kate uh, throughout the day, building a, a not like it, it wasn't my, it certainly wasn't my longest treatment. I bet it was about 14, 15 pages, mm-hmm. but it, you know, it was, it was, it was pretty detailed with each kind of scene of love. Like, you know, I, the way I do a treatment is, is I'll do the slug line for where we are, you know, like, it, it, and it won't be, you know, for example, we have a giant gulag sequence in this. It would just be exterior gulag. I wouldn't be doing, ex- you know, exterior gulag and then interior in for like each little moment of the scene. But I'd just be like, this is our gulag sequence. This is basically what happens mm-hmm. here. And once we all, once I did that and we went through that a couple of times, 
and Kevin had read that and Scarlett had read that and everyone had kind of weighed in. That was when I went off. So it was really just, but it was, I think it was because of the nature of what they were a little bit later getting closer towards uh, production when I, when I came in. So everybody was, was, I think normally you can have like a couple drafts of things, but we had, we were just dealing with a little bit less time. So mm-hmm. everyone was kind of hands on as we, as we got the treatment to the place we wanted to be. And then uh, the draft that I wrote off of that became our production white draft. Gotcha. I'm curious throughout this process, just developing, you're dealing with a good number of people. How do you deal with notes that you don't necessarily agree with um, when they're coming down to you? Um, how do you deal with the people giving them? And then ultimately, how do you try and implement them? Well, there's, there's kind of two different ways. There's like, uh, there's two, uh, or at least I can think of right now, there's a million ways to disagree, but the important ways are the, the logical way that you, you can disagree because of logic and you can just disagree because of creative opinion when it's something like this when it's <clears throat> thor ragnarok or black widow and i disagree creatively i will make a point of it and make my point heard but ultimately i feel like you as a writer have to remember that that these are these big kind of studio things you don't you don't own them like i didn't i never created natasha romanoff or thor odinson or yelena belova like these characters existed in many ways beforehand this is not my passion project about, you know, my autobiography, autobiographical childhood movie that I own. Like this is a, these, these movies are bigger collaborations. So I feel like as long as you make your point uh, once of, Hey, I think it's, I think this is lame and I think it'd be cooler to do this way. Sometimes they might just say a lot of, most of the time they listen to you. Sometimes they'll just say, Nope, we want to do it the other way. And then it's just your job to swallow it and say, I'm going to do the best version of the lesser idea that I can. And I feel like that's kind of, you know, that's, that's a, that's a pro pro move right there because sometimes, sometimes you'll find the better version in the version that you thought was worse. Mm -hmm. Uh, As far as logical disagreements, that, that becomes more, I, I, I get more, I put more of a shoulder into that one where, you know, I think the best way to deal with it is is, uh, sometimes you can just get to a whiteboard and kind of explain like, okay, if this person does this, then and they don't know this, then they would never do that because they don't know, you know, mm-hmm. the, the, the information doesn't line up. But sometimes I find it better to just kind of without any sort of superiority or, or, or kind of without it putting anyone down, just kind of ask the questions of like, okay, well, why would they do that? Because of this, well, no, you forgot that they don't remember this. This hasn't happened yet. Mm-hmm. And then like if people, normally people would be like, oh yeah, shit. All right. We, we put ourselves into a loop here and we've got to correct it mm-hmm. uh because i feel like I, I, one of the major jobs of, of the writer especially the writer in the movie and production is your 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 continuity for the story continuity for the logic you want to make sure that 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 nothing contradicts itself mm-hmm. yeah yeah i'm curious too um so it's really important to raise your hand and make that make that uh, apparent. yeah yeah for sure good advice um i'm curious too i heard a quote from scarlett johansson something to the effect of her character in this film was not as sexualized as some of the other black widow characters and i'm just curious how conscious are you of sort of the collective mood of the country with these sorts of social issues and i'm not looking to say anything controversial here i'm just sort of you know what does screenwriters kind of have to know about sort of the collective mood of the country when you know they're dealing with other people in meetings and that sort of stuff you know i try not to i, I don't really think about it honestly i, I especially with this one because this is as someone who has read black widow comics and also someone who has worked on and off for marvel studios mm-hmm. for for 10 years now I, i'm very familiar with natasha romanoff and different version how how i see her as the cool like mm-hmm. the cool she, i think she's a cool character and there's there's my personal version where i think this is the coolest version of her so I'm trying to write the coolest. Natal- I'm not trying to write uh, a specifically female superhero or a specifically sexy or unsexy uh, superhero. I'm, I'm trying to I'm trying to think of it from Natasha character logic uh, and kind of uh, you know personal emotional conflict and resolution. That's that's kind of how I I try to approach it. And sometimes I don't know. Sometimes sometimes it's good to tread that line. There is there is a line in this this movie that I fought for that I then almost regretted at the premiere, which is which is David Harbour's character, uh, Red Guardian, uh, after he's broken out of prison, says, is it your time time of the month? Which is a misogynistic and outdated joke. Mm -hmm. But he's a misogynistic and outdated character. And I got, when I wrote that in, it was just, 
you know, revolt around how can you can't? It's like, no, it's his his character. And the and the thing is setting up Yelena and, and Natasha to kind of tear him down and make him uncomfortable with this. Like they turn the whole point is for them to turn it back on him. But man, I will tell you at the premiere, mm-hmm. when he said that line, I heard surround sound groans and I was like, <laughs> Oh no, we can't come back. Yeah. Like I was I was very worried that I that I had made a mistake. And thank God for you know, uh, that the, the groans died down enough to be able to hear Florence really kind of give it back to him with the whole, you know, that's what they do with the forced hysterectomy and, and make him uncomfortable. But yeah, there was, there was a moment there where I, I, I was worried that I, I was totally out of touch and had screwed up. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So that's an interesting story. Um, I'd like to just wrap up the interviews asking the guest if there's anything that they've seen recently that they thought was really great, that maybe was a little under the radar that, you know, would be good for screenwriters to check out. Is there anything you've seen recently you really liked HBO, Netflix, Hulu, any of these services? Um, maybe there's something that was a little under the radar. Let's see. I mean, I don't know if it's under the radar because it did get some nominations, mm-hmm. but the great, the, the, it came out last year, the great starring Elle Fanning and, and Nicholas Holt is from the right. I'm ashamed to not know his name, the writer who did the movie, the favorites. Uh, it, it's a, it's a period piece, which is not normally my kind of thing, but I just, I found the writing to be incredible. I found the choices to be incredible. I, I was constantly surprised by the, entirely character motivated moves but like i just didn't see him coming and i'm pretty good at seeing stuff coming so i uh yeah i would i would highly recommend the great okay, perfect to uh anybody 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 you know 16 17 or over perfect perfect yeah that's a it's good kind of graphic. yeah that's a great recommendation i usually ask the guest as we're ending um where their film is playing i think black widow is playing pretty much everywhere is it on disney plus now as well uh it is on disney plus and it is playing in the theaters i personally love seeing it in the theaters perfect. but you know, however you, uh, however you want. <laughs> perfect. Perfect. And what's the best way for people to keep up with what you're doing? Um, Twitter, Facebook, a blog, anything you're comfortable sharing, I will round up for the show notes. Oh, I mean, I'm on Instagram as my Instagram is shimmy blue jeans, but it's really just uh, a kind of silly thing. I don't do too much work, gotcha. work stuff on there. It's, kind of see Instagram as a toy. So, well, uh, yeah, if anybody wants to check that out, that's fine. But if not, also, it's a lot of pictures of me and my friends. Perfect, perfect. So, well, Eric, I really appreciate you coming on and talking with me today. Um, good luck with this film and all your future projects as well. Awesome. Thanks so much, man. Nice talking to you. Hey, thank you. We'll talk to you later. All right. Bye. A quick plug for the SYS Screenwriting Analysis Service. It's a really economical way to get a high-quality professional evaluation on your screenplay. When you buy our three-pack, you get evaluations at just $67 per script for feature films and just $55 for teleplays. All the readers have professional experience reading for studios, production companies, contests, and agencies. You can read a short bio on each reader on our website, and you can pick the reader who you think is the best fit for your script. Turnaround time is usually just a few days, but rarely more than a week. The readers will evaluate your script on six key factors, concept, character, structure, marketability, tone, and overall craft, which includes formatting, spelling, and grammar. Every script will get a grade of pass, consider, or recommend, which should help you roughly understand where your script might rank if you were to submit it to a production company or agency. We can provide an analysis on features or television scripts. We also do proofreading without any analysis. We will also look at a treatment or outline and give you the same analysis on it. So if you're looking to vet some of your project ideas, this is a great way to do it. We will also write your logline and synopsis for you. You can add this logline and synopsis writing service to an analysis, or you can simply purchase this service as a standalone product. As a bonus, if your screenplay gets a recommend or a consider from one of our readers, you get to list the screenplay in the SYS Select database, which is a database for producers to find screenplays and a big part of our SYS Select program. Producers are in the database searching for material on a daily basis. So it's another great way to get your material in front of them. As a further bonus, if your script gets a recommend from one of our readers, your screenplay will get included in our monthly best of newsletter. Each month we send out a newsletter that highlights the best screenplays that have come through our script analysis service. This is monthly newsletter that goes out to our list of over 400 producers who are actively looking for material. So again, this is another great way to get your material out there. So if you want a professional evaluation of your screenplay at a very reasonable price, check out www.sellingyourscreenplay.com slash consultants. Again, that's sellingyourscreenplay.com slash consultants. 
On the next episode of the podcast, I'm going to be interviewing screenwriter and fellow podcaster Jeffrey D. Calhoun. He runs the Successful Screenwriter Podcast, which you can find anywhere podcasts are available. And he's also a screenwriter. And we talk very specifically about how he's been able to get gigs and get projects produced, which is a lot of networking, but he goes into great detail about it, really explains how he's been able to get a lot of the gigs that he's gotten over the years. So keep an eye out for that episode next week. That's our show. Thank you for listening.